welcome to Grace Bible Church ProSide Online. As a Christian, God sees our faith and blesses us with His presence. It gives us hope and strength to do the impossible. What is even greater than that is when we become that blessing to others. Pastor Norman Akanishi opens our Christmas series, The Greatest Gifts of All, with his message, Presence of Heart. Presence of Heart, and it's play on word. The greatest present we can give someone is the heart of love. And Christmas is a series about that, this Christmas series, but Christmas is also about Jesus coming to be with us. Jesus came to be with us, yes, in the form of a child. The great prophet Isaiah said, the virgin will conceive eons of years before it happened and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? It means God with us. And you know, the Lord is especially with us and closest to us when we walk through valleys, hence the 23rd Psalm, which most of us are very familiar with, which reads, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. For even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I, and I, and I, I want to bring this out this morning because, see, Christmas, and this is the industry that we're in, the profession we're in, Christmas is a contradiction where it's the most wonderful time of the year and the most awful time of the year at the same time. Most suicides and marriages break up during this time of year. Most families break up during this time of year. And yet there's, if you look on the outside, there's just such a joyous time. How many of you love Christmas? I was a little slow. Okay, I'm going to raise my hand because I think I'm supposed to raise my hand. I'm in a church. So, listen, we love Christmas, but, you know, I talk to police officers in our church, counselors, and our pastors know that it's also some of the most miserable moments because the joy accentuates people's discouragement. And when Jesus came, he came really to walk us through the valleys because through the valleys we come to the mountain peaks. Mountain peak, valley. Mountain peak. Most of us think that we're supposed to live on the mountaintops all the time, but how many of us have discovered in life that's not possible? That the valleys are very necessary, and the Lord says here, He meets us there. He comforts us there. He walks us through. Now, Jesus came to bring us the gift of salvation, securing eternity in heaven for when we pass from this earth, but also the gift of relationship with Him on this earth so we understand our destiny for why we are here. But the gift of our salvation is the result of coming to be, Jesus coming to be with us. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Who's the thief? It's the devil. I have come, he says, but that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus lived the perfect life for us. God has a high and holy standard. None of us can live up for it, to it. And for our eternity be to be secured, someone perfect, and only Jesus could do it, had to live the life for all of his life on the earth to fulfill God's law on our behalf. That's why it's all grace today. We don't have to live perfectly. But also, it was accomplished, this redemption was accomplished as he then laid his life down for us. Jesus came to die. I mean, we look at the little infant Jesus and it's so heartwarming, it's so wonderful. You see the Christmas lights, you see the manger scenes, it's so intimate. But the reality is that if that's all Jesus was, we're in big trouble. He had to die ultimately 33 and a half years after his birth to shed sinless blood to pay the price for our sin. He had to die to pay the penalty for our sin. So Jesus was born to die. And what we do with him will define Christmas for us because Christmas is really about the fact that he did come to live a perfect life at the end in his perfection to pay the penalty for our sins. Prince of Peace. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep which we are. You know, the Bible likens us to sheep, which is really a divine insult because sheep are stink. They can't clean themselves. Woolly boogers are attached to their fur. We'll leave it at that. Too much information. 
They can't clean themselves. They can't feed themselves. In fact, when I say that, they can't discern between a poisonous pasture and a healthy one, and they are dependent on the shepherd. In fact, they will just follow their nose and end up anywhere and be ravaged by animals unless the shepherd leads them. But sheep have an amazing ability to discern their shepherd's voice apart from any others. And that's how Jesus wants us to live. He wants us to live with ears that are very, very attuned to him. But like sheep, we sometimes go astray. The book of Isaiah says that. And we end up in ditches and gullies and valleys, sometimes because of choice, sometimes because somehow God says in my, in my sovereignty, I'm going to lead you into a place to deepen you. I have there in your notes, in trying times, he makes us lie down so he can refresh us. That second verse, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. I think the Lord would prefer to lead us into quiet waters gently where we kind of know, okay, I need to slow down. I need to hug my wife a little closer. I need to kiss my husband 12 times a day. I need to pay more attention to my children. I need to watch my health. How many of you ever heard that? That little voice that says, too much coffee. Right? Things like that. Right? Watch out. Don't eat that pork chop. Yeah, I, I, I'm being humorous, but sometimes, you know, the Lord says stuff like that. He says, do you really need to buy a fourth big screen TV to watch the Dallas Cowboys? <laughs> Pastor Parris said, yes. <laughs> and sometimes the Lord will let us make choices, and instead of being led beside quiet waters, he, he makes us lie down. Pastor Camille is not feeling well today. I almost made her lie down in green pastures. Because she's so tough, Pastor Camille. She's like Pastor Mother Teresa, Camille, Graham, whatever. And with her, Pastor Paris and I have to wrestle with her and say, Pastor Camille, do we need to make you lie down? See, because sometimes we're so excited about life, and the Lord goes, I don't want to shout, so I'm going to make you lie down. And so sometimes we get sick. A business fails. A marriage starts shattering. And yet God is still in control. If in the valley, we'll look to him. And it's in the valleys, he guides us. I have here in your notes, he guides us through life's unexpected valleys. By how? By walking what? With us. Take a look here at verses 3 and 4. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Some of you are in valleys today. You go, you know, Pastor Norman, the thing about how Christmas can be a discouraging time, that's me, because right now I'm in church because life's not happening. Re my relationships are not happening. Finances are not happening. My health is challenged. You're in the right place. You're not here by accident. You're here because you could have been anywhere else. You could be before, a, be before a television set watching Seattle. No, that's later in the day. You could be in a mall. And real men don't do malls, by the way. They do footballs, but they don't do malls. Okay, just saying, just saying. All right? Well, I'm saying you could be anywhere, but you're here today. And it's not by accident that you're here, that you're, that you're really at rest and at peace where the Lord can speak to you. And if you let him, he wants to walk with you through your valley. Yes, he does. Um, here's, what, here's the urge for many of us who are challenged or in a valley. Resist the urge to climb out by ourselves. Resist the urge to try to man up, to try to gimmick it, to try to be strong and just have a little bit of Jesus and a lot of me, a lot of you. Because sometimes when God has us lying down, he says, look, I want you to stay down so that it's me that's bringing you up and through. And sometimes the Lord says, I'm not going to just bring you out of the valley. We're going to walk. What does the scripture say here? I'm going to walk you through. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to speak to you. But it's going to be through and not out yet. About six years ago, I got to know this guy who, who was known in our city as Honolulu's best-dressed man. 
I must be Honolulu's worst dressed man. It's a 10 year old Aloha shirt. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not that kind of a guy. Some of you look really fine. You're, you're geared up, you know, you're in church and all that. I'm not that guy. So this is a contradiction of a relationship, but we got to know each other because his life blew up. Everything that he touched up until that point turned to gold. His children were at Punahou School. His business was absolutely thriving. Um, successful in every regard, in media, in athletics, in business, in finance. Until one day, his wife decided to depart the marriage, much to his shock, a wife that he dearly loved and his children loved, father of three girls. It was at this moment I got to know him and spend a lot of time with him, walking him through the valley. He grew up in church all his life, got to talk to his mother, his mother on the phone who was healed of cancer years ago. The doctor gave her a death sentence, three months and you're gone, get your affairs in order. She says, no, I don't think the Lord's done with me yet. And sure enough, the Lord healed her of cancer. And this man's mother spent years and years of her life praying for cancer patients in hospitals because God, they said, we got to bottle you. And, we need, and, and so she was, but, but the pain of it was her son didn't give his heart to Jesus because he was so successful, so, so gifted. He didn't need God, even though he grew up in church. And how many of us know growing up in church doesn't mean you go to heaven. Growing up in church doesn't mean you have a relationship with the Lord. It's what you do with Jesus to, to make your heart a manger for him to live there by faith accepting him. So in getting to know him at the same time over a period that's, that's, that's oh, I call it the season of valley. Not only did his business begin to tank and his wife depart the marriage, his mother and his father died. And he got audited by the IRS. Now, that's a lot of stress. And I realized that in this season of time, It was my role, along with others, in the group I invited him to, grace group that Pastor Paris talked about, to walk him through the valley. And I knew it would be not instant. And one of the things that I had to do was make him realize, you can't fix this. You can't gimmick this. You can't charm your way out of this. This is about Jesus wanting the gift of your heart. You gave him the gift of your presence in church growing up, but now he wants your heart. And I said to him, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what Christmas is about. Your heart becomes the manger to say, Lord, come in, and then I will follow you. And I don't know where you are this morning. But in walking with him, he had to understand that this would be God taking him through. Well, make a long story short, you're in at that time, your 50s, and being the charming man he was, most people re f figured that he could get any woman he wanted, and, and many women did want him. But what was interesting is he gave his heart to Jesus for the first time. We led him to the Lord. He let the guys in his group, and there were not many, walk him through what I call the temptation to jump out of the valley in your own strength and look good. Because he was so well connected in the city. And then one year and then two years, people said, ah, oh, he'll, he'll find a woman. Women will find him and he'll be fine and they will live happily ever after. And one year turned to two years and to three years and then to three and a half years and then moving on to four years, and in my time with him, I said, you know, God said it's not good for man to be alone. And what I really, really appreciate about you, you've grabbed the hold of Jesus, you're sharing him, you're trying to live for him, you're being a great dad, a single dad to your three girls now. And I said, you know, but I said, uh, Adam was asleep, he wasn't dead. Adam was, you guys got that in Genesis? Okay, I read your Bible now. Okay, Genesis. Adam was asleep and God brought Eve to him. And so we pray for this. And it, I went from, hey, no go dating around now. Okay, don't just make stuff happen now. You know, it's rebounds. You know how that can work. And then, but at three and a half to four years, I thought, we got to help a brother. 
And so we began to pray the other way. And then out of the flash, he brought a picture to group. And it shocked all of us on the sly because of a Christian couple on the mainland who knew this woman from Kona, Hawaii, who was living in San Diego, a businesswoman. He flashed a picture to me and he said, Norm, what do you think? I looked at it. I looked at her because I knew this guy needed a certain kind of woman. How many of you know that men need a certain kind of woman? Yeah. How many of you know women need a certain kind of man? Twinkle could only marry Paris, right? She would have no other. Paris waited a long time to get married because he, he, he wasn't jumping out of any valley. He enjoyed the valley. In fact, we had the same concerns about Pastor Paris. <laughs> so, <laughs> you got to leave at 11 to handle the new building, so I'm going to throw down, okay? I'm not going to throw the iPad, but I'm going to throw you down. All right. <laughs> and I looked at it. I went, listen, honest. I said, whoa, man. You got that? You're slower than the 8 o'clock service. <laughs> right? God brought Eve to Adam, and you know Adam said, he named him, whoa, woman, woman, whoa, man. You got that? Come on, wake up. Wait, slap yourself, all right? Yeah, slap yourself a little bit, all right? Make a long story short, every step of the way, he included us in the process. And I said, you know what? If you marry this girl, you're marrying up. And he goes, no. What are you talking about? That means she'd be marrying down. I said, I didn't say that. Don't put words in my mouth. Well, yesterday, after six years, four of which were in the deep, dark valley, I did his wedding. And there's a picture of the couple. Now, for those of you who don't know, his name's Artie Wilson, and this is Marie. Kona Wina girl from Kona, Big Island girl. And uh, they were looking for a confirmation for their wedding date, okay? And they, because of their, their relationships and family abroad, they couldn't find the right date. And usually they sit right here, actually in this service. They come to this service, yeah. And the day they were looking for a confirmation, they had decided, they told me, look, um, we're going to do the wedding uh, on December 13th of this year. They were saying, you know, because of all, the, the, there's no perfect date. How many of you know there's no perfect date? Date, 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 calendar date, okay? And this is, we're going to do it on December uh, 13th of this year. And they looked at the chairs they were sitting on. They were sitting in chair 12, 13, and 14, which was yesterday, 12, 13 and four. I was so slow when he told me that. I went, yeah, so? <laughs> and I realized there's only, there's not too many 12, 13, and 14. Their wedding yesterday, the toasts were amens because they wanted God to be honored. It was called so be it. I've, look, I've been at weddings all my life. Nobody had a bunch of amen. I had mabuhai, banzai. Nobody went amen. Amen. Coach Jones led one of the toasts, amen. This other guy led the toast, amen. They were, it was God honoring. And I remember six years ago the hellhole that Artie was in. Marie's husband also left her after 17 years. She loved him. And sometimes stuff happens in life we cannot explain. And then God does something if we hold on to him and not just gimmicks. And God has a way of bringing answers together. It took everything in me to hold back emotion as they walked up the aisle. Now, some of you are looking at me like, how come you don't do weddings anymore? I thought you don't do weddings anymore, Pastor. You lie. <laughs> Our church is split up into 300 grace groups, and all of my pastoral staff who, who do a great job, they cover sections of the church. So I have a section, and in that section, if, most, if people get married, I will do those weddings. Because if all I do, or some of our lead pastors do weddings, with a church our size, that's all we'll be. It will be Grace Bible Wedding Chapel. <laughs> weddings and funerals and baby. And that's, God called us to train leaders and make disciples to change the world and to win the world to Christ. But this was a moment. Here's what I want to say with, to you. This guy was self-made 
and everything he touched turned to gold. But there comes a valley in everyone's life. And I had to say, Artie, you've got to hang on to Jesus. You've got to grab on. I talked to his mother before she died. She says, my boy, he's a good boy. And Pastor Norman, you hang on to him. You pray for him because he's going to come to Jesus. I said, yes. I said, I recognize this voice. Sounds like my mother's voice when she used to tell me, you get your butt out of the nightclubs and into church, son, because if Jesus would come tomorrow, where would you be? I mean, she'd tell me stuff like that, right? You know, mother, she's, she lives next to me. She's 86, and somehow when mothers speak, you listen. It's like E.F. Hutton, baby. And uh, sure enough, I believe she was watching yesterday. I could almost hear Mrs. Wilson's voice from heaven going, you see? I told you. But it wasn't just me. It was our group. And when Pastor Parrish talked about group, there are people God calls us to hold in our bosoms. Just like Jesus, you see in the pictures, picks up a lamb and holds that lamb in his bosom. There are relationships we are to stay close to because they are heaven's assignment that we are to walk them through the valley to Jesus and to the next mountaintop. Yesterday was a mountaintop moment. And all kinds of emotions and memories rushed through me, including the beginning of this dark valley. Where are you this morning? Do you know people who need the Lord? Because I'm going to close with this. The Lord wants us to be a shepherd who refreshes others. The greatest gift we can give to the Lord in the gift of... How many of you exchange gifts for Christmas? How many of you exchange gifts with Jesus? Nobody. You know why? There's only one gift exchange. God says, I give you my only begotten Son, that whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. With meaning, when Jesus' final words was, go make disciples, really the Lord is saying, your gift back to me is your heart and the hearts and lives of others I put before you. And that takes time. It's not a random invitation to our Christmas services only next week and our Christmas Eve services the following week. It's not just get people to the building for a day and I've done a religious duty. No, better that you would say, Lord, who do I hold through the valley as a friend, as a loved one, that through constant relationship and touch, I can walk to you that I can carry them. This is so important. The story of the Good Samaritan, is it talks about a man. Jesus is talking in the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. He talks about a man who's beat up and robbed, and we find that religious leaders see him, but they're on, they walk on the other side. You know, we can, we can see the need, we can feel for people, but the Lord calls us to go to people. And, and, and the story, a Samaritan who was the most despised person among God's people in that day. As he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise, because the expert in the law only would not, he would avoid Samaritans. And Jesus knocks him on his butt, and he says, that's what you should do. And next week, Sunday, when we have the keiki performing and it's our designated Christmas service and the Christmas Eve services, of which we'll have 14 of them, at Regal, at Kaneohe, that's a miracle. The theaters on Christmas Eve are letting us have Christmas Eve services. And that's not just for Christians. Christmas Eve is a time that unchurched people will go no matter what. And then after that, they can watch Interstellar. Or God, Exodus, gods and kings. You know what I'm saying? And it's a, it's a great, great moment. But better yet that after the events of next week, Sunday the 21st Christmas, we keep holding them. We keep in touch with them. And the people that most are open to the Lord are those in the valleys. 
Who do you know that's in a valley? What family, what friend, what loved one do you know that's in a valley? Con start praying for them. Go to them. Connect with them. Invite them to your group. But most importantly, invite them into your life. You know, this time of year is, is, is so challenging for many. And if we're, we've got our ears open, the Lord will, and our eyes open, the Lord would lead us there. Recently walking, I, I, still walking a person through who lost his job and got cancer at the same time. And um, that's not to mention something else that occurred. It was a, a legal accusation against his life, which has since been proven false, which added stress to everything else. How many of you know that's a perfect storm? And he couldn't get out of it the hole by himself. And this is years of relationship. And I realized the Lord's saying, you, Norman, go help him. And so just spending time with people, he's doing well now. But along the way, Faye and I dug into our bank account to help him because the cancer surgeries were far exceeded his coverage. I'm not saying this, Doug, look, folks, I want you to hear me. I'm just saying that. That's what the Good Samaritan did. And so we gave him a lot of money to help him through. Our relationship has spanned nine years. And just when you thought he was doing well, just when you thought he was doing super, the roof caved in. And that's when we need Jesus to be there through us for others. Walked another, walking another person through who lost his marriage. Walking another person through two people who in our group, one lost his job because of a completely false accusation which has been since been proven fabricated. Another person through who was falsely accused by a team of fellow employees because they were jealous of his impending promotion since been exposed. You have no idea what happens. I mean, we have problems in the state government that go far beyond the AD. And sometimes you have to go into the storm with people and feel their pain. And in the midst of that, lie down with them and say, Jesus, come and touch them. And he wants to do that through you. Tomorrow, I'm going to go see a basketball game of a 13-year-old who almost died. And I got in touch. This I just happened to connect with this family who asked if we could spend time. And then Faye and I went to pray for him. And a virus was attacking his brain. But our grace group prayed. We prayed. And over the journey, the Lord healed him. And now he's playing basketball again. So tomorrow, I want to close the loop. This family's now started to come to church. Okay? I want to go close the loop and be in the gym and watch this guy lead his team of one of the leading prep schools. And I want to... You know why I'm going? This is selfish. I'm going for me. Okay? Hopefully, he'll be encouraged. <laughs> 60-year-old guy. Okay, hey, listen, I used to play point guard. Okay, badly, mind you. But I want to be there because I want to be a reminder to the family. Look, I care. And I want your boy. I've spent a lot of time with you. But I want the boy to see me because hopefully as he sees me, he'll see Jesus through me. I had to think about the traffic. I had to think about, you know, all those kind of things, Right? As we close today, my question to us this Christmas, who will you carry and hold in your heart that Jesus wants to touch through you? It's the greatest gift exchange of all. Who is that? And there's more people, I can tell you. You, you see, what I've given you right now is a glimpse into how I use my time. Most of these people are unchurched. They don't know Jesus. They don't have the Jesus you have. Some of you are here this morning. You don't know the Lord, yet we want to give you an opportunity to do so. Because as Artie will tell you, growing up in church and knowing the Bible does nothing unless you actually come to the point of saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, take over, and be my Lord and Savior, and then start following Him. This is tomorrow. 
I'll be at a basketball game. And the reason why I say it's selfish, because like the wedding yesterday, I want to close a loop. And I want to see the miracle on the court leading his team to a victory in the playoffs. You know what I'm going to do when I sit there? I'm going to soak in and give gratitude to God for his awesome faithfulness, remembering, oh, the power of a grace group when you pray for miracles in a season of miracles. Can I leave you one last story? Okay. Some of you are falling asleep, so I better change. Okay. Um, John Glenn, some of you send me these things. And this one came through my wife, through someone in the church. A lot of people have asked me, how do you get those stories from? You. Actually, okay. And this one's about John Glenn and his wife, Annie. John Glenn, for those of you who don't know, was one of the elite Mercury 7 astronauts that put us into space, first man to orbit the Earth. All American athlete, all everything, handsome, golden boy, but he fell in love at a very, very young age with a girl who couldn't talk. Her name was Annie. She had a speech impediment. And I want to kind of read you the story here. John was the future Marine fighter pilot, the future test pilot, because they had a romance very young. But he was pure gold from the start. Three-sport varsity athlete, most admired boy in town, Mr. Everything. But Annie Castor, though she was caring, should only talk could only talk with the most excruciating of difficulty and it haunted her. Her suffering was so severe that it was categorized as an 85% disability. 85% of the time she could not manage to make words come out. When she tried to recite a poem in elementary school, she was laughed at. She was not able to speak on the telephone. She could not have a regular conversation with a friend, but John Glenn loved her. Even as a boy, he was wise enough to understand that people who could not see past her stutter were missing out on knowing a rare and wonderful girl because he looked past her speech and into her heart. They married on April 6, 1943. You go, whoa, that's a long time ago, brother. You're right. As a military wife, she found that life as she and John moved around the country could be quite hurtful. She has written, I can remember some very painful experiences, especially the ridicule. For those of you in the military, you know if you're an officer and you're high up there, wives fraternize, sororitize all the time. And they talk about people. And what, it's what you wear and how you act and what are you doing and what are you wearing and what, you know, where do you live. It's a real status thing. In department stores, she would wander unfamiliar aisles trying to find the right section, embarrassed to attempt to ask the sales clerks for help. In taxis, she would have to write requests to the driver because she couldn't speak the destination out loud. In restaurants, she would point to the items on the menu. A fine musician, Annie, in every community where she and John move would play the organ in church as a way to make new friends say, oh yes, by the way, they are Christ followers, have always been. She and John had two children. She has written, can you imagine living in the modern world and being afraid to use the telephone? Hello used to be so hard for me to say. She said, I worried that my children would be injured and need a doctor. Could I somehow find the words to get the information across on the phone? John, as a Marine aviator, flew 59 combat missions in World War II and 90 combat missions in the Korean War. Every time he was deployed, he and Annie said goodbye the same way because it was so stressful for Annie. She couldn't talk. Her hero and her husband would be gone. She wasn't sure whether he'd come back alive. And his last words to her before leaving were, I'm just, was, this was the tradition, I'm just going down to the corner store to get a pack of gum. I'm just going down to the corner store to get a pack of gum. And with just the two of them there, she was able to always reply, don't be long. And that connection brought such peace. On that February day in 1962, when the world held its breath and the Atlas rocket was about to propel John Glenn into space, you can imagine if you're her, she's going, oh my God, nobody did this before. Okay. Once again, those words were uttered. In 1998, many of you remember this, he was 77, he went back to space aboard this shuttle Discovery, and it was an understandably intense time for them. What if something happened to end their life together, they thought. She knew what he would say to her before boarding the shuttle. He did. But this time, he gave her a present to hold onto. Not only did he say he was going to get the pack of gum, this time he got the pack of gum and gave it to her. He said, I'll be right back. She carried it in a pocket next to her heart until he was safely home. And you know, miracles happen sometimes when you're in the valley for three decades and more. There was a breakthrough in speech therapy. And a specialist worked with her. And I'm going to read it here. The miracle she and John had always waited and prayed for at last. 
as miracles do, arrived. At age 53, she was able for the first time to talk fluidly and not in agonizing, anxiety-written bursts. Watch this. Listen to this. John Glenn said that on the first day he heard her speak to him with confidence and clarity, he dropped to his knees to offer a prayer of gratitude. He's written, I saw Annie's perseverance and strength through the years, and it just made me admire her and love her even more. He said he has heard roaring ovations in countries around the globe for his own valor, but his awe is reserved for Annie and what she's accomplished. He says, I don't know if I would have had the courage. And today, her voice is so clear and steady now that she regularly gives public talks. If you ever find yourself in an event where the Glens are appearing, you want to see somebody so bring, brimming with pride and love, you wait until the moment that Annie stands to say a few words to the audience, and as she begins, take a look at the gleam in her husband's eyes. They're alive today. They're still giving public talks, except she's the public speaker and he's the admirer. She's 95. He's 93. And the reason this works, not only was it the presence of Jesus, but John Glenn, John Glenn, the hero, always told her, I'll always be here. I'll always be present. You have my heart, no matter what. If you watch the movie, The Right Stuff, I have the DVD, you will see some of the embarrassing moments reenacted of how people treated Annie Glenn. And John Glenn would always saddle up next to her, put her arm around her, and said, this is my girl, and I'm so stinking proud of her. His presence of heart in her life in, allowed her to endure the valley where one day, at age 53, the miracle happened. Today, if you heard her speak, you would have no idea. You would have absolutely no idea. John Glenn carried his wife in his heart. The pack of gum. Someplace this Christmas, we need to be that pack of gum and be Jesus to others. Your presence will make a heaven of a difference. Who is that? Who will that be that you stick to them? On Monday, I'll be watching a basketball game, connecting to a mother and father who just two and a half months ago thought they would lose their son. It has forged a relationship. They live on the other side of the island. But you know what? Love is not convenient, is it? I know all of you are going to invite people next week, Christmas Eve. But hang on to them. Carry them through the valley. Don't just invite them and drop them like a bad habit. Carry them in your bosom. Give them the gift of your heart. <laughs>